everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and the folks from ASUS store sent us their AS202TE to take a look at. And this is a network attached storage device for consumers, kind of in the same line as uh, similar devices that you might find from Synology and from QNAP and from WD. Uh, what this one has, though, which I found rather unique, is what's on the back, and this is where we're going to focus a lot of our review on. Uh, is this HDMI port because it is possible uh, to hook this up to your television and be able to use it as a media player in addition to a storage array. So uh, what you can do with this is rather than have you know, devices connecting over your network to grab data off of here, this can not only uh, store the data but also play it back and that can maybe reduce the amount of things you have plugged into your TV or whatever, I don't know. Now it does have a fan on board and it does have hard drives whirring inside so it's going to make some noise uh, but if you have the right kind of video files it will uh, play them back. Inside it's got an Intel Atom processor which is actually more powerful than a lot of these other devices that I've looked at in this product category. Uh, those are typically running with uh, ARM processors, you know, kind of smartphone processors. Uh, this has an Intel x86 chip essentially, an Atom chip which is used in Windows tablets like my Asus here but uh, it is capable of running uh, probably a little bit more robust software perhaps than uh, some of those other devices have on board. Uh, the one thing it's crippled by though is that it only has a gigabyte of memory. Now uh, in a network attached storage device for doing basic file sharing that's often not a crippling amount of memory. However, uh, what's happening is, is that if you want it to act as a network storage device and a media player, having a gigabyte of RAM is very limiting and I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. A few other features to point out is that it's very easy to get at your drives here. There's a, this is a two drive array um, you can basically just uh, pop your hard drives in, slide them in and out. I believe you can hot swap them uh, if your array is configured properly, probably in RAID 1 mode and not RAID 0, of course. Uh, RAID 0 basically combines these two drives together, so you get more performance and basically uh, the combined uh, storage space of both drives. However, uh, if you lose one of the drives, you're out of luck. So I often recommend running, is how I run all my network attached storage devices, in RAID 1, uh, which means that each drive is mirrored to the other. So if you lose a drive, uh, you're still uh, protected with your data. Additional data protection, of course, comes from the ability to back it up, and this one has a lot of USB ports on board. So you have a USB 3.0 port on the front. This is also tied to a button, so you can push this button here, and uh, if you set it up correctly, automatically dump the contents of a USB 3 device to the storage array automatically. So you can walk up to it with a you know, camera picture card or something and just hit the button and you, will, you can dump your entire day's photographs onto here safely and automatically uh, without even having to boot up anything. Uh, on the back you've got another USB 3.0 port, that HDMI port which we'll be spending some time on, and then you also have two USB 2.0 ports. Now what I've got plugged into the other USB port down here is a keyboard so I can uh, basically use this on screen and it's a really it's a nice little keyboard that I reviewed earlier it's got a little dongle that connects and it's basically uh, you know standard USB uh, trackpad and uh, keyboard and it works just wonderfully and, and it works very nicely with this with no drivers. Uh, Asus Store also has a remote that you can use for using it for a uh, home theater navigation which is an optional uh, add-on. Now what's nice about having all these USB ports is that you have a lot of options for doing backups so you can plug in an external hard drive or three or four uh, and set different folders to back up at certain times. It's really pretty flexible, uh, very much on par with what uh, QNAP, Synology, and WD have. It's really nothing, there's nothing really innovative in that backup procedure, but uh, it has that same feature and can very easily back your data up for you. Uh, you also have, of course, gigabit ethernet for connecting it to your network. And before we get into some of the other features, I did want to touch on the web-based control panel because this is where you have to do a lot of the initial configuration. So there's essentially uh, two interfaces on the device. You have uh, the interface that you're going to have on your TV when the device is plugged in and that HDMI port is activated and you also have an interface on your computer which you're going to use uh, with your web browser to connect to the drive's internal web server. So uh, what you want to do is kind of step through those things initially because uh, you have to actually activate that HDMI feature through uh, this, uh, th this web interface in the first place. And what you're going to see is once you do that, you lose a lot of available memory. So remember, this had a, has a gigabyte of available RAM, at least RAM that is installed on board. But when you uh, start running video out to the HDMI display, it needs to share some of that memory uh, with the video hardware. So you immediately drop down to about 696 megabytes of available memory. And then you have to get judicious about you know, which of these services you'd like to have on here. I'm not going to step through all of these in this video. If you do have questions about specific features, I'm happy to do a follow-up. Um, but basically, it works a lot like the uh, Synology and the QNAP drive do in that you've got this virtual app store here that you can use to download uh, different functionality. So for example, we could install this Dropbox widget here, and that will allow us to sync a, a particular folder with Dropbox, same with Google Drive. 
Um, there's a few other backup applications on board. The one thing that I noticed that it didn't have is a kind of a roll your own cloud solution. So the Synology and the QNAP both have kind of a Dropbox equivalent syncing tool where you can uh, have files on your local computer and work on them offline and then have them sync when the internet connection gets back up. You know, it really mirrors Dropbox capability. The Synology drive has an awesome uh, tool for that. Uh, this lacks that, but you could use you know, Google Drive or something else to uh, run it through there. All right, now we're going to check out the HDMI interface, and we've got the optional remote here. And again, you can use a keyboard. So if you've got like one of these wireless keyboards or something, it will also work. In fact, you can uh, navigate it just by moving the arrow keys around like so. Uh, but we can also do the same thing with the remote here, and you can use either one, which is kind of a neat thing. So what the first thing we're going to do, though, is pull up uh, XBMC. And before I do, uh, just to show you what this looks like on a better uh, image, this is basically its own little X server that they've simplified uh, to basically allow it to operate with a remote control. So uh, ADM is the web-based control panel that we looked at earlier. You can run it on your television if you want to do some configuration. Uh, Chrome is the web browser Chrome we all know and love, and I'll show you that in a minute too. Uh, but we're going to start with XBMC, which uh, many of you know as the kind of the quintessential home theater application, and we're going to let that boot up. And one of the things that I noticed as it's loading is that uh, it's only running with the, uh, the Frodo version, 12.3. That's the one that's available in the ASUS Store App Store at the time that I'm recording this, which is not the most current version. So uh, if you're looking for version 13 on this, it's not yet available. You could probably shoehorn it some way, somehow. I'm not going to get into it now because you know, I'm looking at kind of the consumer experience that we're going to get out of it. Uh, so at the moment, it's not the most recent version of XBMC. But you know, once it loads up, it pretty much behaves uh, like you would expect it to. So I'm just going to pull out here to this uh, view here. I'm going to load up uh, my test file, which is a Blu-ray dump of Star Trek Into Darkness. And we're going to just navigate through the menus here. I have it uh, copied locally onto my array here, and we're going to go back and play that. Now, what I was surprised about, and you'll see here in a minute, is that it was not able to play that film like all the other devices that are capable of playing that film have been able to play it back. So things like the WD TV Live, uh, the, uh, the Roku 3, all those devices that I was very impressed with their ability to play back Blu-ray MKVs worked. Uh, this one, it's playing it back, but it's running at maybe a half to a third of the frame rate. And uh, this was the first file I tried. This one just doesn't work. This is not playable, not watchable. Uh, however, other movies did work okay, and they were even able to pass uh, the D DTS and the Dolby Digital Sound off to my receiver. However, you know, if I have a m movie or two that doesn't play, the chances are you're probably going to have a movie or two that doesn't play either. And I'm not sure what's going on here. I think it's likely software because, again, it was playing back other files, uh, just not this one and probably a few others perhaps that were encoded the same way. I don't do any transcoding with my Blu-ray MKVs. I'm basically just uh, dumping out the actual file to a more convenient format for me. So the fact that it wasn't able to play that back smoothly uh, is an area of concern and I think something that we need to wait for some software updates on. All right, now we're going to check out the Chrome browser, and this is something where you're going to want to have that keyboard I showed you before, because having an ability to use a keyboard and mouse in a more traditional way is a better way to navigate, obviously. Uh, so we're just going to go to Amazon real quick, and you can see uh, how the page loads up. It does seem to load up fairly quickly. It feels uh, pretty natural as you scroll through. It doesn't really have any real constraints there, so uh, that works nicely. Uh, what doesn't work as nice, however, is YouTube and things that require a little bit more video uh, playback. So it'll start off a little stuttery, and I have it kind of running here in the background. Uh, kind of queuing up, so we'll see how it works. But as you can see, it doesn't, it kind of jitters a little bit. It, there's not a lot of smooth playback to it. And again, that's because uh, we don't have a lot of memory available to us on this device. So it's just rather slow in getting uh, those types of tasks going and still being able to run all of its other server stuff at the same time. So, uh, so not a very good uh, media playback device from the web browsers per si side of things, but uh, it certainly can uh, do basic web browsing pretty well. Now, the next thing we're going to take a look at is something I know a lot of you are interested in, which is the Plex server capability. So we're going to take that uh, Blu-ray file that we had trouble with on XBMC and see if we can have it encode in real time uh, to my uh, computer here to see how well that does. Let's take a look. All right, so we are connected to the ASUS Store's Plex server with my uh, MacBook here, and we're using Ethernet, so the uh, network shouldn't be an issue. Uh, but as you're seeing here, it's kind of frozen, and that's because that real-time encoding of a Blu-ray MKV uh, to something that my web browser can play back is just too much for this to bear. Uh, so I don't think you're going to be using this as your primary Plex server, especially if you're trying to do a lot of that real-time transcoding. Uh, what might work would be files with you know, a little less of a uh, overhead to them, you know, things that might play back natively on the browser anyhow, things that the Plex server needs to do less with in order to get it over 
to your device. I think those things would work fine. But uh, if you're looking for, you know, playing back those Blu-ray MKVs and having them transcoded in real time, I don't think this will be up to the task. It just doesn't. I think the processing power is probably there. Maybe, maybe we're probably pushing it on the processor side. Uh, but that lack of memory uh, is also going to be an issue there as well. Now, for its primary purpose as a network attached storage device, it actually performs quite well. We're getting anywhere from 50 to 65 megabytes per second in write speed and anywhere from 80 to 100 megabytes per second in read speed over a gigabit Ethernet network. That's really good uh, for a device where it's located in the marketplace. It certainly keeps up with uh, everything else that I have tested, and that's partly due to having that Intel processor on board. It's certainly uh, able to move data and bits a lot faster than. Uh, perhaps some lesser powered devices are concerned. But um, what it's lacking is enough, you know, enough hardware to really do the things that uh, those of us who would buy a device like this would do. So you know, we buy storage arrays because we put big disks in them to run big files off of. And it, you know, it kind of struggles on some of those Blu-ray MKVs. You know, we saw you know, some inconsistency and in playback on uh, the XBMC side of things. And it certainly doesn't have the horsepower uh, to run its own Plex server and do those files uh, in real time transcoding to another device. So, uh, if you're looking at it for, for those purposes, it's probably not going to uh, foot the bill. But I do think if you're you know, using files that have already been transcoded into smaller formats, things that are not as taxing, it should do uh, actually pretty well uh, with those kind of files and you know, maybe eliminate an extra device on your network. Uh, as a network attached storage device, it's a little bit more limited than uh, the Synology is and to, to some degree the QNAP. You know, the interface is not as slick. Uh, but also it lacks that Dropbox syncing capability, at least you know, if you wanted to roll your own Dropbox versus using a third-party service. So it was disappointing not to see that on here. But uh, for the most part, most of the features that you'll find on those other drives uh, are also in here because most of them are using open source projects. It's just that they're a little less polished on here. So um, I'm not quite ready to recommend this yet. I do think if they do some software updates, add some optimization, uh, you know, maybe address some of these issues that uh, we're, we're seeing related to uh, video playback on XBMC and maybe getting it up to the current version, I think um, I'd like to take another look at it. But right now, I just don't think it's quite there yet. Um, it does you know, put things on your television screen. It just doesn't do them all that well just yet. This is Lon Seip, and thanks for watching.